So good afternoon everybody, and thank you for coming along today. As you wait for the projector to warm up, hopefully it won't take too long to get to the point where you can actually read it. Um, I'm here to talk to you a bit about systems thinking, with the uh, full title of my pack being Slaves to Process and Punished by Rewards. Why service organisations need a systems thinking approach. Now, some of you might be a little bit um, confused by that title, some of you might think it's a little bit over dramatic, but why we're here today is quite simply for me to give you an introduction. What is systems thinking? What is it all about? We'll be talking through a few examples to bring it to life as well, so it's not just in a theoretical context, and we'll talk about quite a few other bits and pieces along the way as well. What I'm really looking for you guys, from you guys today is not just me talking at the front for the next however long it takes, but I'm looking for interactivity, which is what this picture is supposed to represent, even though it's not entirely obvious. So what I want from you guys is ask questions as we go, rather than just saving it up to the end. If there's something you're not sure about, then just put your hand up or just ask whatever you guys normally do. And I'll be going through a couple of examples, a couple of exercises as well to try and get your thoughts going as we go through it too. So please do ask questions as we go rather than just saving it up for the end. In terms of what we're going to talk about, um, I'll give you a little bit of background on, on me and a little bit about the history of system thinking itself before then going into effectively what it's all about. And those four things that we have listed there, understanding what customers want, these were the primary things, talking about targets and measures, what customer demands are, in other words, what is it they're asking for us to do as organisations, and the effects of management thinking. This is something that I'm sure you guys will be quite interested in as well, and how that manifests itself in what system thinking really means. So, a little bit about me. I don't know what you've been told about me already, but I can give you a little bit of background on where I come from. So, I went to university um, over in York, in the northeast of England, too many years ago for me to give a date and I studied theoretical physics of all subjects and came from there, got myself a job at a company called Customer Systems, doing IT consultancy, did that for a number of years but wanted to move from what was a technical degree, a technical expertise, to something a little bit more management focused. So what I did is I did an MBA at the International University of Monaco and that was specialising in entrepreneurship at the time. That was back in about 2008, so quite a few years ago. From there, I did a little bit of um, consulting work. I had my own business that I ran uh, for a little while, um, which also included a bit of consultancy work. I had a, a couple of business ideas following my MBA as well that didn't quite bear any fruit, but I went down the road with that. And after a little while, I was offered a job at a company called Aviva, which is an insurance company. Has anyone heard of Aviva before? Yeah, a few hands, not very many. They're UK based, but they operate around the world quite a bit. Uh, so you might have heard them, or you might recognise them now that I've mentioned it as well. And I joined Aviva using my technical background, but hopefully with a bit of MBA knowledge as well, as a development manager. So I ran IT projects within the company's IT department. And I was first exposed to systems thinking because this was a piece of work that Aviva had brought in some consultants to help them out with and it had some fairly profound benefits in some of the pieces of where they'd looked at implementing it in other areas of the business. And so while I wasn't at first involved directly, I got a taste for what it's all about and I could see the sorts of benefits and changes that it made as well. What then happened is that as it started to grow within the company as a set of principles, I was invited to become a systems thinking consultant. So what I did for nearly a year in the company was take the principles I'm going to talk through with you guys today and to roll this out across the business. This is something that was very much a management top-down driven thing, but as hopefully we'll talk through today, made a lot of sense and resonated quite well with people on the shop floor as well. And I did that for about a year, and went back into the business as a project manager, moved on then to LV, Liverpool, Victoria, who you probably won't have heard of unless you're from the UK, very much a UK only based insurance company. And at the time, they didn't really use systems thinking at all. 
and me being a project manager as opposed to anyone more senior than that or a change specialist as such, I just got on with my day job while still using some of the principles that we'll talk through. And what's happened over the last few years, I've been there for four years now, is that LV has started to embrace system thinking as well. A little bit due to me, but mainly due to some of the senior managers who they've actually brought in from Viva. And over the last six months or so, I'm now in charge of a, a programme of work of about 20 to 25 projects, where we use system thinking principles in what we do. And I won't go too much into detail on what that programme is, but effectively it's to speed up how we do our uh, quarterly and annual reporting in the finance department. So it is something which um, is gaining traction at LV at the moment, uh, becoming a big thing, and I think it's something that um, is starting to be noticed a lot more by our competitors, by the industry, and by other companies as well, not just insurance. So be pleased to know it's not very much an insurance-based lecture. If you Google system thinking, has anyone actually done that before the lecture today? Yeah, a few people. What did you guys find? It's a recent technique, it's not old. No, it's not old, that's true. Yeah. Anyone else? <coughs> no? Okay. Well, there's a few things that you'll probably find. The systems part of systems thinking really comes down to the fact that whenever you look at how something works in a company, what you want to do is not just look at your particular team, your silo, your department, even your organisation or where the office is. What systems thinking is all about is looking to extend that and see things as end-to-end -end as possible, effectively from the customer's perspective. So when we talk about systems, we don't mean IT. We mean just the system in which people work, just how the organisation is put together, what our processes are as part of that. So, to understand how things work, you need to say the end-to-end performance. And as well as that, you need to understand everything about how things work. Which means not just what you can measure, what you can define, but intangible elements as well. So when I say intangible elements, I mean things like the culture of the organisation, uh, what assumptions people make in terms of how they work with other people, how the work is supposed to work. And also, management perspective. How management approaches things, the techniques that they use, those things can be quite difficult to measure. And it's only by understanding all of those things that you can also, on top of the tangible elements, understand how well something is working and therefore how you want to change it to make it better. <coughs> and I guess the other thing you'll probably find is that continuous improvement is important. So pilot, learn, adapt, all of those are good things as well. You don't just want to find yourself going down a road that isn't working. If you can find out it's not working sooner rather than later, you might want to stop. If you find something to change, then change it. And that's what you probably find if you Google systems thinking so in a nutshell. What we're going to talk through today is not, not really a lot of this, it's, it's more, more than that. And a lot of what I've learned comes from a company called Vanguard. And Vanguard is a consultancy who is set up by a chap called John Seddon all the way back in 1985. So he talked about not being old, but he started to lay the foundation at that point. He's probably the most, uh, most fatherly figure we can probably say in terms of what systems thinking actually is. And what he did is he studied a few different bits and pieces over his time. He studied the Toyota production system. He studied the work of likes of Edward Deming, likes of Ono as well, how to improve the way that the work works. And what he did is he adapted those things, which are primarily production-based tools and techniques, for more of a, a service-based context. So production is the obvious, you produce things, but in a service organisation where you're dealing with customers and you're not producing things or widgets or whatever else, you need a different way of approaching things. And he was really um, the father of what that actually means. And he came up with a method, Vanguard method, and all of that means is it's a practical way to apply some of the principles that we're going to talk through today. And I'm going to focus less on the method itself, unfortunately we don't really have the time today. I'll be focusing more on those key principles we should be able to take away. And from that, he wrote a book, 2003, so relatively recent, certainly my age, called Freedom and Command and Control. And this was released um, without a lot of fanfare. 
and to steadily gain traction as he and his consultancy and other companies have started to understand exactly what it's about. But effectively, this is where it came from. That book in 2003, if you get the chance to read it, is, is very much something I'd recommend. So, what we're going to talk first about is customers. Systems thinking is very customer focused, which may sound obvious in you if you're working for a service based company, but I can tell you now it isn't very obvious at all. And what we will probably say is a truism is that service organisations deal with customers and customers place demand on the company. In other words, customers ask you to do things. Whether it's asking you as a company to um, set them up with their insurance policy, whether it's to change your address, whatever else it might be. That's what we're talking about when we talk about demand. Customers asking you to do things as a company. So to do this, what a company will typically do is standardise processes. Why do you think we standardise processes? Cost. Cost? Possibly, yeah. It's seen as being cheaper because you can hopefully get used to doing it and tuning things out quicker. Any other reasons? Yes? The level of quality. Quality level, possibly a bit more predictability in terms of how things work. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe on an organisation level, it just makes it easier. Uh, when everything is standardised. Um. Yeah, if, if things documented, you've got a, a script that you can follow, yeah, it can be quite easy to work. do that. Yeah, because of that, you can have the training you can for and those sorts of things as well. So there's quite a few reasons that, that we probably look at. Um, what that typically leads to is standardised procedures, scripts that people have to follow, typically letter by letter, and functional specialism as well, so you get teams who only deal with a particular thing because it's seen that if you standardise things, you want to pass things from one team to another and they can deal with those particular specialisms. But if we do this, do we consider that question? What do you guys think? Do you think that all customers want the same things? No. And you think that if they ask for something, even if on the surface it appears the same thing, do you think they might want things in the same way? <coughs> no, we wouldn't. So actually, a one-size-fits-all approach isn't really going to work for most of your customers. And therefore, it's really not going to be good for your company in the long run. We're going to talk through a couple of brief examples to kind of highlight that point. So one is, is a sales example. And all the examples that I've talked through today are real-life examples that, that I've seen in, in what I've worked through. And this is an example that some of you guys might have seen. If you phone up, um, maybe you need to buy a new mobile phone contract, whatever it might be. And typically with, with finance-based things as well, what will happen is that the service person on the phone will read a long script. And they'll be asking for certain pieces of information, and then they might spend two or three minutes literally <coughs> reading from the script, talking through certain terms and conditions, and legal things, etc. as well. And there's logic behind why you do that. You want to make sure that everyone hears this. But what they don't tend to ask you is, have you heard this before? So what they don't say is, well, have you seen this on the internet? Maybe you have. Have you phoned up yesterday and heard the same thing? Have you phoned up for the last five or six days straight and heard the same piece of script time and time again, and every time have to sit through it? And this is a symptom of standardization, of keeping things simple. Unfortunately, it can annoy your customers. Another example might be with compliance. So we're talking about internal customers here, rather than external customers to a company. And I've worked in places, particularly working in the insurance industry, where you need to go through a set of basic training every year, with the idea is that you talk through things like fraud prevention, health and safety, those sorts of things. And you can spend a good three or four hours per person every year getting through this. And again, there's good logic behind this. The company needs to make sure that people know their stuff on these particular subjects and that they're following the right procedures. But what they don't typically ask is, has this person done this module for the last 10 years straight? And knows all the answers at the top of their head. If we're talking about health and safety, why does everyone in the health and safety team need to go through this basic training as well? Which they do to tick the, ex the, the box of the exercise. What they don't ask is actually, how much do you know? And they don't do a test up front. Now thankfully, 
I've seen actually where this has changed. So I've seen the previous way of working where you do that, where you'd have to go through three, four, even more sometimes, depending on your industry, hours of basic training. Now I've seen it, in my company I work for now, where what will happen is they'll give you a test beforehand. So if you have done this for a long time and you know your stuff, you can save all of that time and effort. And it's all of that time and effort which otherwise would just be, be wasted because it could be put to a productive use. What this all comes down to is trying to understand what it is that customers want from you. So this particular chart here shows a curve. And what this curve effectively shows is how far you move away from a customer's nominal value. And when I talk about nominal value, what I mean is what a customer wants, how they want it. And so what this curve shows is that as you move in this direction, perhaps, so you give the customers more than what they're asking for, as a company, that's a waste of time, effort, money. If someone phoned you up to ask for a car insurance quote, you don't want to send them flower and chocolates every time. They might say they'd even like that, but actually it's not really what they want or what they need. Fundamentally, it's a waste of money. But it also works the other way around as well. If you don't give a customer enough of what they're actually looking for, then what that will mean is that they'll come back to you. They'll be requesting things to be repeated, to be done properly, and that actually ends up costing you as a business. It takes more time, it takes more effort to do those things, but also it's word of mouth. You're losing future customers' business, you're losing the potential um, friends and family that they would tell in terms of how, how everything worked with you, and so that costs you more as a business as well. And what this fundamentally comes down to is it's what the customer wants as well. Coming back to a little bit of what I've already talked about, it's far too easy to say, well, we know what people want. This is it, let's give it to them. We might assume that everyone needs to hear a script. We don't actually ask them. We might assume that everyone needs to go for that basic fraud training. We don't actually do test effectively asking them as well. And it's important to realize it's the customer that sets this. And as a person working with customers or as a manager, then you shouldn't be setting that for them. You should try and understand that first. And that's not always easy. Now, if you need to understand what it is that a customer really needs or what they want or how they want it, how would you do that? Awesome. Yes, yeah. So why do so few companies tend to do that? I've seen a couple of couple examples here. I'm not going to labour the point, but maybe as you go through today, you might start to think about, actually, am I really being listened to? Are people asking me, actually, what it is that I want here? Try and think about that. We'll talk through another example now as well, just to highlight. This is... Um, an insurance based one, I have a lot of those unfortunately, um, and this is about shed theft. And I don't mean this, I don't mean theft of a shed, it's a bit difficult, I mean more like this, theft from a shed. And the particular example I'm going to talk through is about a lawnmower. So if you've got a shed or another outbuilding, then you might have an insurance policy that covers you if your mower gets stolen. Now, what your nominal value might be is, I want my mower to be replaced. I love my mower, it's fantastic, just give me a like for like replacement. And typically, this is what insurance contracts are all about. If you ever have to go down that route to get to replace, whether it's a mower or whether it's a phone or whatever else, typically they'll give you a like for like replacement. What they don't tend to necessarily ask you is really if that's okay for you or not. What you might have is you might have a customer who is perhaps getting a bit elderly, who thinks, actually, that big heavy mower, I've had it for 20 years, I don't want another one like it at all. All I want is a nice light mower that I can whiz around the lawn with and cut the grass a lot easier, now that I'm getting a little bit older. And they have a different nominal value. You can see that they've moved down that list side, and what they want, for, for good reasons particularly, <laughs> is, is a lighter mower. Now, what a lot of companies don't do, insurance companies in this case, is to try and understand that. They will always typically do this replace my mower point. And if it's not meeting that customer's <coughs> value, if you force them down the route of replacing theirs with a like for like, without giving them actually maybe a lighter one, which is what they want, 
then what could that mean? It could mean things like they don't renew their policy, or they don't see the value of taking it out if they're not going to be listened to. It could mean that actually they, they phone up and complain that that's actually not what they wanted or they're not happy with the replacement they've been given. This creates extra work for the company, it creates extra costs. And that's the sorts of things that you should be avoided. If you listen to the customer and you ask them what they want, and if they say that they want a lighter one, that actually saves you money as a company as well, because it might be a cheaper model. <coughs> Another example might be, um, actually, this person who's had their lawnmower stolen is moving house. And they might be moving to an apartment. And if you move to an apartment, you've not really got a lot of use for lawnmower. There might be other people who, for other reasons, might want cash equivalent. <coughs> and what this would mean is they had a more of a place, they'd be in a similar position. They might not be happy with that, they might complain, you might lose their business, you might get them phoning your call centre, giving you extra costs as a business as well. But what do you think the dangers might be of just giving everyone cash? Why do you think insurance companies go down this route in the first place rather than just giving people money? Any others? Yes, deter fraud. Fraud? Some extent. Yeah, fraud is the main reason. They do this because if you give them a like for like, then they're no better, they're no worse off, is the theory. So there's no reason to do the fraud. If you give them cash, then it means that they're much more likely to, to claim on the policy because then they clearly they can spend the money on whatever they want to. So if we go down that route, then the thing to consider there is how do we maybe think if it's fraud or not? And so what companies like LV starting to do is think about actually what are our fraud indicators. In this particular example, again these are all real life examples, what has happened is that this particular person did phone up and say that they were moving house into an apartment, they didn't need it, and the fraud, the fraud um, indicators went wild because they wanted the cash. And what you can do is you can look at their history. You can say, oh actually they've been a customer of ours for, for 10 years pay their policies on time every year, they've never claimed before. Um, they could have asked for more information, you could say, show me some proof that you're moving into an apartment. But actually in this particular instance, it wasn't really worth it. And it was much better from a company's perspective to give them the cash equivalent at that point. So there are some practical considerations which do need considering whenever we're talking about not just this principle but some of the other principles as well, which, which does make systems thinking a fairly difficult thing sometimes to get. There's a few grey areas there. But by giving them the cash equivalent, you get a much better, a much happier customer. You have a better relationship with them. They turn up their friends. And it, it makes it so that it's better for the business in the long run. What you probably want to think about is if you then get half of your customers next week phoning up with stolen lawnmowers and they want cash, you might want to consider that is actually something that you don't necessarily want to do. So you take these things into the sphere of practicality too. But as a principle, you'd want to understand really what the customer needs and try and fulfil that demand given other restrictions that you might be working under. Another particular principle of system seeking is about targets. So in the UK about 13, 14 years ago, quite a while ago, um, we went from a, a monopoly company, British Telecom, who gave out directory inquiry queries. In other words, if you need to know the number for such and such a restaurant, or you want to know the number for something else, you'd phone up British Telecom and ask them for that. Back a few years ago, a number of years ago, that was all um, opened up to competition, and a number of companies, including this one, came along. Woman eight, woman eight. They did a lot of adverts with these two um, running men. Um, it was a particular thing that caught on the, uh, the UK mindset and uh, became quite popular. And the company was doing quite well. And what they wanted to implement was hopefully a way of improving the customer experience, while if they possible, possibly could, making costs go down as well. So what the management of this company did is they introduced a set of targets for their staff. So they said, you might get a phone call that comes in, we want you to answer that phone call within 44 seconds. If you can answer that phone call within 44 seconds, for a certain percentage of your calls that come through, we'll give you a nice bonus, a nice incentive to do that. 
And that seemed to be working quite well. They were getting lots of calls in, call times were coming down, everyone seemed very happy. And so what the management decided to do was to make things a bit more difficult. Far too many people were hitting this 44 second target. So they decided to tune it down to a bit more difficult 33 seconds as well. And to their surprise, they found that actually everyone was hitting that target as well. They were paying out loads of bonuses. And they, they thought nothing of it. They thought that people were just getting clever at what they did, getting more efficient, and, and things were all tucking, uh, trucking along very nicely. Um, but they then started to find that complaints started to go up. And they actually had a, um, a person from the press who had a tip off one of the staff members about the ways of working. And what they found is that people were just cheating the system. They were giving out wrong numbers. And this was on an epidemic sort of scale. <laughs> and there was this big thing in the press, you know, BBC, all those guys kind of had it back in 2003. And this was simply there because the management put into place these targets. And these targets were then driving people to do that, to get the bonuses. There were not just people who were giving out just the wrong number, willy nilly, but there was one particular clever person who I always remember who would give out a phone number to a number that was always engaged. So every time that they would phone that number, the customer would think, oh, it's just engaged, I'll try again later, they might try again. They might phone 118 again and say, can you give me another number? The first one hasn't worked. More money for them, without being the wiser. It's only through, through doing this that they found out. And as you imagine, if you're not just the person on the phone, but if you're one of the managers of those teams, you'd be bonused and targeted on that as well. You've absolutely no incentive to find out the cheating. What you want to do is your team to get through uh, and complete their calls as quickly as possible so that you get your bonus as well. The whole company was in it at that level, and the senior managers were completely oblivious until this came up. Now, if you were one of the senior managers in this particular company, and this story had broken the media, and you found that there were a number of people who were giving out the wrong number, what might your reaction to that be? What would you do? I mean, discipline the staff or change the incentives. <coughs> Discipline the staff or change incentives. What do you think they might have done? Blame the staff. Blame the staff. Yeah. They fired what they called um, a, a select group of people who were doing this, even though it was actually academic. And they did this because they thought that they had a people problem. They thought that actually the, the problem is with those particular bad people who shouldn't have been doing that, then maybe they shouldn't have been. But in a way, you can't blame them. So what did management assume about the problem? I guess I've already said it. They, they assumed that they had a people problem. But what was the actual cause of the cheating? Wrong incentives. Yeah. Wrong incentives. And who's responsible for that? So, unfortunately, there's not a happy ending to this story. The management didn't necessarily see the errors of their way and change things immediately. They just fired people and they kept on going as they were. But you can clearly see from this example that it's that system in which people work. It's the incentives that they're given. It's the management approach that makes them work in a particular way. So what they should have done is they should have said, actually, look, our target's the problem here. What we should be doing is either changing our, our targets and incentives, or maybe getting rid of them completely. Why do you even need them in the first place? Just worth thinking about. Another kind of couple of examples on that theme might be uh, a 48-hour SLA. So that's uh, what I mean by SLA is a service level agreement, which is, uh, you might say, um, you work in an admin team, you need to respond, to an email from customers within 48 hours. And that's what, again, you might be measured on, you might have an incentive against. In that particular environment, what might your behavior be to customer emails that come in? How might you treat those? Not, I'm saying you, don't, you obviously are not gonna treat them that good, and you're just gonna do the same thing, basically, 